It's 11.07, so we'll go ahead and begin the lecture. Uh, because of the event that was held in here, we had to suspend the class, suspend the last lecture, talking about this new capital city that was to be constructed um, by Louis XIV, who would be the monarch in France under whom France would really emerge as the first consolidated modern nation. The um, pick up where we left off, the, um, the king at the age of nine uh, was living actually in the Palais de Tuileries, uh, which was located approximately here at the uh, time that his father, Louis XIII, died. And um, there was a, an outbreak of mob violence, and the royal entourage had to flee the city of Paris. Um, they escaped in a carriage in the middle of the night. The carriage was recognized. Uh, the crowd threw rotten fruit at the carriage. One piece of fruit apparently hit his mother in the face, and something he never forgot. He swore that he would never set foot in Paris again, and as far as we know, he never did. They took refuge in the royal hunting park of the Bois, B-O-I-S, Bois means wood, the Bois de Boulogne. There we see the Tuileries and up the Champs-Élysées and down into the Bois de Boulogne. And then the following, early the following morning, they escaped the Bois de Boulogne, traveling here through St. Cloud out, um, out to Versailles. The um, Versailles had actually been a hunting lodge owned by Louis XIII. And uh, Louis XIV declared that um, when he actually achieved his majority status at the age of 18, that he would build a new capital for a new France at Versailles. His engineers and architects tried to talk him out of it. It was not a particularly good site. It did not have adequate water supply, etc. But uh, the king was determined, and at that point in time, what the king wanted, the king got. And um, that's why I call my wife the Duchess of Barksdale. What she wants is what she gets. Right? That's a joke. Please don't tell her I said that. <laughs> um, and um, so Versailles was not simply the royal residence or a simple chateau. It actually was intended to be a new capital, a new capital city uh, for this new conception of the new France, something that uh, will appear again in the 19th century when a lot of the precedents and principles that will come into play here with the construction of Versailles are actually put into service in the remaking of the entire city of Paris under Louis Napoleon um, beginning in 1851. This is the, this is the chateau. Um, there is a backstory to this, and that is that um, there was a trio, a landscape architect named André Lenote, um, an architect named Louis Laveau, and a painter named Charles Le Brun. They had been classmates at the Royal Academy. Lenote, having come from a family of gardeners whose father and grandfather had been actually in charge of the uh, uh, Grand uh, Jardin de Tuileries and the Petit Jardin de Tuileries, um, while André was growing up adjacent to the Palais de Tuileries, which was an extension of the Louvre. Um, but he was the first such person to actually um, go to school, in other words, to, to get a full education in the arts, in painting, and so on and so forth. And it's interesting to me that he was, his title was, uh, became Jardinier du Roy, gardener to the king, but he was listed on the pay vouchers as chef d'architect, the chief architect. So it was really Lenote that was in charge of the whole operation. How did this come to be? Um, the backstory is that his fi Louis the, the 13th finance minister was a man named Nicolas Fouquet. Fouquet was a brilliant guy, uh, very handsome, um, erudite, uh, impeccable manners. Everybody loved him brilliant uh, finance minister, and he decided to build himself a chateau, 
uh, which is known as Bola Vicomte. This is not going to be on a test, so you don't have to worry about all the pronunciations and spellings and so forth. Um, and he hired uh, Lenote, who then turned around and brought his two friends, Laveau and Lebrun, into the picture and completed this great chateau. And at the opening of the, the sort of housewarming party that Fouquet held for, um, for the opening event of this great chateau, um, he invited the king and actually dedicated this event to the 16-year-old king. Uh, the opponents of Fouquet, who were many, seized on this opportunity to plant rumors in the young king's mind that Fouquet had actually been stealing from him, stealing from the royal treasury. How else, they said, would he be able to afford such grandeur, such a great place? And um, the king um, actually bit on the rumors and ultimately imprisoned Fouquet uh, Alexandre Dumas actually wrote um, a fictional novel sort of based perhaps on this event, loosely, which was known as The Man in the Iron Mask, although it was actually the king and his twin brother, his twin brother having been imprisoned. Fouquet was then imprisoned at the Bois de Vincennes on the eastern end of the city of Paris, and um, his, his wife, um, Madame Fouquet was allowed to retain ownership of the property, or at least life tenancy, on the estate, at which point, at her death, it then reverted to the crown, to royal property. And the king um, went and sacked the place, taking statues, taking uh, artworks, taking everything that he could. And he even then, to build Versailles, to build this, he brought in the trio of Le Note uh, Laveau and Lebrun. And so it was that they would actually execute the design for this, not only the chateau, the seat of the king, but also um, the seat of the entire government. Uh, this is what we see uh, about 1668. The, this, was, this event occurred in 1661. Uh, the king, or 1659, the king achieved his majority in 1661 and began work on this. And the biggest problem was water supply because it was sort of on a slight hill, and it's down what we see off here in the distance was actually a kind of swamp. So they had to actually bring water in from quite a long distance away, and they did it by creating these kind of paddle wheel things in the river, like an Archimedean screw that would actually bring the water up to a holding tank, which could then get enough head pressure to distribute it to Versailles. This would become important because of the incredible baroque spectacle of the number of fountains that existed eventually at Versailles so that to this day when they turn, it's now used as a public park, when they turn the fountains on on Sunday afternoons um, in the summertime, there's a noticeable drop in the water pressure in everybody's faucets in the city of Paris. It's an extraordinary amount of water. What we see here is the embryonic chateau. What will happen eventually is that Wings will be extended to the left and to the right, and this town, the service town, like we saw at Richelieu, um, actually would be built um, around here. We see three radiating avenues, again, A apostrophe venue, to an avenue, to a place, which were intended to connect Versailles to the major um, sort of public buildings. Now, at this time, when we use this term public, what we mean is something different than the way that we would use that term today. Today, when we say public, public transit, public park, you know, the public, um, what we're talking about is everybody, right? What you would be talking about here in the 17th century would be those who had proximity to the royal court, those who were actually held some official position within the king's government. Um, that was the definition of public. Um, there, there, it, it's actually, there's an anomaly in this which still exists in an archaic form in England. What they call public schools is what we would call private schools. Follow me? You, you, go, you go to a public school means that it's what we would call a private school. Um, so the sort of notion of Georgia Tech as a public school is something that is not, that is foreign uh, at this point in time. You received an appointment 
from the king or from one of his ministers uh, to study in any of these schools. The plan, as uh, it was prepared under the direction of Lenote, Andre Lenote, uh, consisted then of two major parts. Uh, the part on your right would be uh, the part that was vegetal, and the part on the left would be the part that was mineral. And by that I mean that the left side was to be the service town for the activities, the maintenance of the, of the, the new um, chateau, the new capital building as well as the gardens and so on and so forth. And there must have been legions of people associated with this because it is absolutely huge. Um, the king, of course, was located uh, in the revamped, that was his bedroom right there, in the revamped um, uh, chateau, the pasteboard chateau of his father. And uh, water was brought in and eventually into a large sort of basin here and then through these Archimedean screws pumped up into holding tanks that could run these fountains. The precedent clearly, if we go back and look at this, think about these two buildings that we see here, the chateau in the central location, and then these avenues here that focus on this point that we see here perspectively. The precedent clearly was Piazza del Popolo. Um, and here we see it with Rinaldi's twin churches at the northern entrance down uh, the Corso in Rome with the Via uh, di Repetto on the right and the Via Babuino on the left. And uh, the second president, the obelisk in the center, and the second precedent, obviously, with this equestrian statue of Louis XIV, uh, was the Campidoglio and the statue of Marcus Aurelius. I want you to notice the fact, uh, look at the position of the feet and look at the position of the arm and then um, notice the same thing here. You see the, the direct, almost copying of, uh, of this monument um, here in the Campidoglio, but now it has been placed at the intersection of these three avenues in the same position that the obelisk would have been in um, the Piazza del Popolo. Now, the interesting thing, it's a sidebar, but the interesting thing about the fact that his feet are hanging like that is that the Romans did not have stirrups. Um, that sounds odd. They seem to have had just about everything else except electricity and the internal combustion engine. Uh, but they did not have soap, and they did not have stirrups. Um, that gave the, um, the Huns and the, the Mongols, when they came out of Central Asia, Asia, they used stirrups. And if you had stirrups, it was a huge technological advantage because it meant what? You could stand up in the saddle and shoot an arrow, right? whereas the Romans couldn't do that. You're, you're, you can't stand up in the saddle um, because you don't have stirrups. Later, of course, they adopted it, as did just about everybody all around the world. But it's interesting here that long after stirrups had been uh, adopted, um, the French version of this at Versailles uh, is so imitative of um, <coughs> Marcus Aurelius that the, the stirrups are left off. There we see it then looking down the Central Avenue, which was headed back toward Paris, and then uh, on the right uh, the, and on the left, uh, flanked by these um, two buildings that we see here. Now, here we have what? Churches. Who's the patron? A pope. Patron here is the king. What are these two buildings? Churches? No, they're stables. These were the, for the royal horse guard. And uh, so he's actually taking, uh, this goes to Matt, Matt back in the back. You, you had a question about, you used the term superficial, which kind of threw me a little bit because I couldn't figure it out. What you're seeing is a kind of transformative action where the plan, the idea, um, and the precedent is adopted, but what you're doing is sort of altering it and substituting other things. So we don't have churches here. We actually have stables, right? And um, where the obelisk would have been in Piazza del Popolo, we now have a statue of the king. The king becomes, at this point, the embodiment of the nation in a very real sense. Um, on the vegetal side, we have a series of gardens which are bounded by streets uh, with fountains at every intersection that we see here. Each garden, then, can be different. 
So 13 can be different from 14. Uh, or they can be the same because you never see it. And you never see it because of this grand allée of trees that we see along here with this thick poche, this very thick hedge, this mass of vegetation, which blocks the interior world at number 2 or number 14 or number 9 from its perimeter. Uh, I think this is significant uh, for the history of cities. I think we see the same thing. The precedent for this was actually the mineral component that Jacques Lemercier had implemented at Richelieu for Cardinal Armand de Plessis de Richelieu in the town. The uniform facades where you enter into the doors, one is a gas station, one is a garden, one is something else, right? A basketball court, something. Um, and the same thing is operating here. Now, the meta, this creates a kind of meta frame, a kind of large frame where um, whatever is positioned here, 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 and there because of this perspectival construction and because of the hierarchy of widths of these street-like spaces, these alleys, um, you have this sort of larger structure so that uh, the king is now in dialogue with this fountain here, and this fountain is in dialogue with that fountain there. And we'll see in a moment the sort of narrative that, it, it, that the king developed, um, or his architects developed under his direction uh, for this particular narrative. There it is. This was a few years back, 1980. Um, there was a huge hurricane storm that came through in 1997 um, and uh, knocked over a bunch of trees. And so they decided to clear cut the entire thing and replant it. Now, they've done this totally. Um, they do it every hundred years because one of the disadvantages of this kind of formality is that you can't sort of randomly plant, <laughs> you know, if that tree dies right there, you're sort of in trouble, you know. You follow me? It's a little bit of a problem here. Well, what is this? So here we're looking at this meta frame. So what is this narrative? Well, the fountain that you see in the foreground is known as the fountain of Latona. Latona in Greek mythology was the mother of Apollo and Diana. And... Um, the king identified his mother with Latona and himself with Apollo. What is she doing here with her two children? The story was that on the, it's a myth of origin, and it's the myth of origin of frogs and turtles, that Latona was walking through the woods one day when she um, stopped to her children, Apollo and Diana, who were thirsty, and she uh, stopped at a pool, at a pond, a spring, to uh, give them a drink of water when they were set upon by robbers, thieves. Now, let me just, I don't think anybody in here is a thief or a robber, but if you are, make sure that if you rob someone, they're not a goddess, okay? Because uh, Latona was not real happy uh, with having her children threatened, and so she zapped all the robbers into frogs and turtles, and that is the origin of frogs and turtles. I love that sort of fabulous construction um, of these kind of, it tells you a lot about the Greek mind. I'll step out here for a minute because this really is a sidebar. I've always been struck by the fact those of us in here who are at least culturally descended from the Abrahamic religions, right, and that's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, okay, all trace descendancy from Abraham. Uh, we're accustomed to the Decalogue. We're accustomed to a God who says, you shall do this, you shall not do that. On Tuesday, you shall eat this, and you shall not carry that backpack this way or something. All right? I mean, read Leviticus. Right? <laughs> it's just read Deuteronomy. I mean, it's incredible, um, the uh, degree. And we know the ten pretty well. Thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, etc. Right? Um, what about the Greek and Roman gods? What did they tell them to do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They were sort of on their own. In fact, the Greek and Roman gods weren't very nice. They would come down and zap you into a turtle. Or, you know, if they saw somebody they liked, they'd say, hmm, 
and they'll appear in their bedroom. Look at Mars and the mother of Romulus and Remus, and I guess they believed it. Um, they were sort of, we were sort of like toys, right? Like if you read the Iliad, the gods are sort of uh, taking sides, right? And they're sort of out like ghosts in the battlefield guiding the spears and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, but there was no commandment to do anything, right? Or not do anything. It was just sort of on your own. I've always been struck by that, and I don't know that it has anything to do with this course, but I thought I would mention it because I think it's worth thinking about. <laughs> Nothing else. It's worth thinking about. Well, Latona, in this myth of origin, originally faced the, um, the palace in the king's bedroom. Uh, but eventually, uh, she was turned around and the fountain was reconstructed when this fountain was built because this is the mature Apollo uh, raising out of the water on his four-horse chariot. So here, the young Apollo is in with his mother, who had protected him during the riots when he was nine years old as they escaped the Tuileries uh, into the Bois de Boulogne. Um, now is the mature Apollo and he wants his mother to see what he has created and what he has done. The most outrageous piece of all of this, and it is very outrageous in terms of capital expenditure, it's just mind-boggling, um, but uh, one of the most outrageous things, which uh, does have something to do with this course and which we will come to later, is this piece of grass that we see in the center. This is called a tapis vert, green carpet. Why do you suspect that would be so outrageous? Anybody? Take a guess. Wild guess. Huh? Well, all of our grass has been imported, so yeah, it's pretty impressive when you think about the amount of lawn grass we have in the United States, all of which is imported from somewhere, even Kentucky bluegrass, native to China, right? Um, but what is really outrageous about this is they did not have mechanical mowing. The lawnmower was not invented until 1849. So what does that mean? Scissors. That's why they had to have a service town. <laughs> There's probably a whole section of that town with people who had nothing but scissors. Right? They had a trade union with people who cut grass, I guess. I don't know. Uh, that's what it looks like after the trees have been removed. So I wanted you to see it, how it was intended to be viewed. And uh, at some point when you're my age, uh, you can go back and it will be back like that, okay, <laughs> of these great chestnut trees. Now inside these, which are called bosquet here, uh, inside here, you will see um, these various gardens. There's the great tapis vert with the mature Apollo looking back toward the palace. Um, and the reason that this becomes significant, I think, in the history of cities is that what it means is that this interior, even programmatically, can be different from this one. Uh, you can actually have a theater here, and you can have something else over here. In fact, you could even have two plays going on in two different theaters at the same time, if you wanted to, because it does not, because of this sort of thick wall, this kind of facade of vegetation, that we see here, that's where we're looking. Um, this right here is this right here. This corner that you see right there is this corner that you see right here, and this fountain that you see right here is this fountain that you see right here. This is the Neptune Basin. And so on the cross axis, um, or on the main axis that we see here, um, it means that you can have a variety of different things occurring in the interior of what amounts to a block, like an urban block, programmatically, while maintaining uh, the large uh, meta frame and the language of that meta frame um, like so. Now, why is this important? Well, I think we will see that it's very similar to um, Le Mercier. It's the same idea, but here it's done with vegetation rather than with buildings. And so um, how many of you, how many of the architects in here are uh, have taken um, architectural theory. One, two, three, four, not very many. Have you? Did you read Loger yet? The French theorist? 
of the 18th century? Well, he writes in there, and you should look for this, he writes that a city would be best if it was designed like a forest. Now, in the 1920s, people interpreted that as a forest like the north end of Piedmont Park, the Nantahala Forest or something, right? That's not what he meant, because a forest at that time was a hunting park that had an etoile or a round point, and then radiating avenues cut through the forest because they were hunting deer. And so they would gather in the round point, and then the deer would come out in the morning to feed on the grass that would grow uh, at the edge of the wood, and then they could take off on horseback arrows, had stirrups, arrows, and they could shoot the deer. Uh, and that's what Loger is talking about, right? And that will come into play in a big way in the 19th century. And the precedent for that, I think, is this, 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 this garden at Versailles. But it's not just the collection of gardens that we see. It's also the, um, the fact that there's a whole town that's designed exactly the same way. So here, the young Apollo with his mother, Latona, is in communication with the major Apollo, right, the, the grown Apollo, and A and D programmatically can vary um, and have nothing to do with either one of them, right? You follow me? Is that clear to everybody? Uh, let me see who that, I, I, this is a very important point. What, it, it, who does not get this? Did, did I not explain that properly? Any questions about that? You see how this works. You've got this large frame, and then you have this thick, sort of mass of this wall, this facade of um, vegetation, and that allows A and B to be in communication and have a master narrative while C and D have something else. You could put a basketball court at D, and it wouldn't change the two red dots. You follow me? It's very significant. So if we look then all the way up to uh, the eve of the revolution by his, uh, actually his great-grandson, Louis the Sixteenth, we will see, in fact, that the garden and the town architecturally are almost the same. So on the right over here, the, what I was describing as this mineral component with all of these places and so forth are now all connected because it was planned um, all connected up in a way very similar to this. That's a block. That's a block. This is a block. Does that mean? Something is beeping. Oh, that's her phone. How do you answer this? Can you answer it and tell her we have her phone? Well, it doesn't matter. We'll just. She's looking for it. Yeah. Um, so what we have then is something in which the entire landscape, to use the modern term for this, um, is all architecturally kind of one thing, some of which are built up out of buildings, some of which is built up out of vegetation. And the hinge between these two material conditions uh, was that your phone? Yeah, it's right here. Why don't you come down this way? Come around this way. This is the single most important point I'm making in the entire course. <laughs> and I've been interrupted 52 times by myself, by the phone, by my microphone, um, by my lame jokes. Does everybody um, understand this, what I'm getting at here? Matt? Yeah, we're, how, what do you mean functionally? Yeah. There's actually, we have, believe it or not, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, um, in the archives, a document written in Louis XIV's own hand for his favorite itinerary through the gardens. 
And it's sort of humorous because they never could get enough water pressure to um, get all the fountains going at once. So his fountain crew um, would actually be, let's say, here. And so he would start out on his carriage, and he would come down here, and they would get this fountain going. They had these things like bicycles, right, that would, in these chains, and it would pump the water. And this fountain would be going as the king passed through, and then they would run over here and get this one going as he comes down here, and he would bring the king of Russia or somebody, you know, with him, you know, the pope, somebody who's visiting some head of state somewhere, some prince somewhere. And, um, but all of the theaters, all the plays, for example, of Moliere are performed first in these, that's where there are. There are no indoor theaters at this point. They're all performed in gardens. So you have, for example, this is known as the Salle de Bal because it's actually an area where they would have dances, musical performances, and so forth, complete with scenery and special effects, apparently painted scenes uh, of mythological characters that they could move on wheels, move into place at the end of these alleys. So I'm not sure what we mean functionally. Um, I would say Georgia 400 is functional as long as there's no one else on it. Um, you know, I-75, 85 is functional as long as it's not 5.30 p.m. Um, but it doesn't do much else. It would be, so here we have something that um, I'm not sure simple functionality in the modern sense of that term is what they were after here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of like saying, is Washington, D.C. functional? It's not functional. So where should Martin Luther King Jr. have given his speech? Is that a function of such spaces? I would argue that it is. Right? Um, so if we look at this, then, what we see is the chateau in the center with the wings of government on either side uh, eventually spilling over into the town. The town itself, complete with market squares and other things, developed. Uh, in a way that is actually very similar to the gardens. And again, uh, based on what Loger is saying, we will see in the 18th century, we will see how this plays out in the 19th century, the extraordinary number of cities that are built in a way that uh, all the way up until the 20th century uh, that are using this as kind of precedence. And there we see this hierarchy of streets, this sort of great avenue that is <coughs> planted here, with two rows of trees, this sort of market square, public square that we see here, the market buildings all around it, and then the individual houses. And in fact, the entire landscape was intended originally to be constructed this way. If we look at these avenues as they radiate out, the intent was eventually they would be connecting up to other important places. There we see that bois, a bois, um, similar to what I was referring to. There's the round point, there's the avenue, there's the second round point, and so forth. And that is applied, actually, to uh, the sense of the city itself. Now, the, this is, I think, best understood in the transformation of the Tuileries, also by Lenote. Here we see uh, the Turgo map, or Vischer, actually, of the early 17th century. And there we see that the Tuileries, the garden, is completely independent from the palace. There's the Louvre. Back down in here, there's that wing that was the first one built. The second one is built up here. You'll notice that the, along the rampart or the wall, there's actually a canal in what is now the Place de la Concorde. And there's a village here. This is actually the worker village, and it is there that Andrew Lenote grew up. In fact, we can see a street separating the garden, which is over behind the wall on the left, from the palace, which is over here on the right. And if we look at the drawings left to us by Jacques Andre de Cerceau from 1550, um, we see that the Jardin de Tuileries was completely, not only completely disconnected from the palace, but uh, it's just a series of garden plots laid down. Some of these, those are trees, trees, and that there's no real hierarchy to this at all. We'll notice a sort of exedra that we see here, but also this walkway. This is an elevated walkway. Because at the time, you were supposed to get up on this walkway and walk around it 
and sort of look down into these garden plots and admire them, admire the beauty of the flowers. They used a lot of colored stone, gravel, and so forth uh, to create these, these patterns, which are called parterre, on the ground. Um, now, this, between 1550 and 1680, the, the um, Tuileries will be completely transformed. Uh, this is actually the plan, then, that was done by Le Note, uh while he is working on Versailles. He is the, 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 gardener's, uh, the gardener to the king. And um, that street that we see here has, here has been completely removed. The wall has come down, and um, that street actually ran right through there. So it is now attached to the facade of the palace. You walk out the front door of the palace. The central axis has been shifted over to a line with the top of the piano nobile of the, of the, of the palace. And then um, this hierarchy has been introduced between these two fountains, this one called a parterre d'eau, parterre of water, and this fountain that we see here. And then the canal has been filled in. The, ra the rampart has been breached at that exedra. Here we have these sort of giant stairs that come up, designed by Laveau. And uh, there was actually a handball court located right here called the Jus de Pomme, which is actually the place where the Impressionists hung their paintings because they were not allowed to hang in the uh, official galleries. Um, this plan is extraordinary to me because what we see is that we've achieved symmetry at the large scale while allowing for a variation and diversity at the minute scale. This is actually a theater that we see here. And um, there we see the very intricate pattern. It's not a very good slide. This can't, This is an old 35 millimeter slide I took out of a book. I've tried and looked and looked and looked to get a better one, and I can't find a better image of, of that. This is what it looked like okay, from this point, looking back in the direction of the palace. That's what it looked like. The palace was burned in 1871 in the last uh, Paris Commune, and uh, the Arc de Carousel actually replaced it. Uh, that's looking down that central allée. There we actually see it uh, from the um, Turgot plan of 1739. And there you see it lining up here and then extending across what is now the Place de la Concorde with its obelisk in the center, and up and across this open field, which was known as the Elysian Fields, or in French, the Champs-Élysées. So the extension of this axis out of the garden became the Avenue Champs-Élysées, literally. And the armature of the garden of this sort of, uh, if you look at this carefully, look at this plan, what you'll notice is that they're actually a sort of colonnade of trees marking these streets with sidewalks in between and then this thickened pochet, which to some degree still exists today, um, which then is extended up the avenue there we see uh, the drawing by Israel Silvestre, which was done uh, in 1680, which shows, again, a theater space here. There's that thick hedge. There are the trees forming these kind of sidewalks, and then the large streets or carriageways. That's the site of the Place de la Concorde, and that is the site of the Arc de Triomphe up here at the ridge line. So it was extended all the way to the horizon. There's another view of it up to the horizon. And that is the same view that we see here today. Now, there's a long and complicated history that comes into play with the erection of the obelisk and the construction of the ark and so forth. And I will put uh, something I wrote on this in the folder uh, for you to read when we get to uh, the 19th century uh, city of Paris. This is a 1980 zoning map of the city. Uh, and it's interesting what the zoning map is showing. There's Place Vendôme. Uh, here is the uh, Palais Royal built by Richelieu. Here is the wing of the Tuileries, uh, of the wing of the Louvre coming up here, finally completed by Napoleon I. A major street, which we'll, we will encounter later in the course, called the Rue de Rivoli, and then the extension of this axis directly up the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, across Place de la Concorde, with its obligatory obelisk, a gift from the government of Egypt to um, the July monarchy of 1830, 1836, I believe. Now, I want to mention, landscape architect that I am, something about this vegetation, because I think today uh, I was giving a lecture once at uh, the University of Georgia over here um, to the landscape architects over there, and this young woman, oh, this is 15 years ago, 
raised her hand, and she very erstwhile in the back, and she said, what gives you the right to prune a tree like that? There's even a term now in the landscape world when you see people cutting back crepe myrtles like they do, pollarding them, called crepe murder, right? This is a moral statement. I said, well, I have, you know, I have no idea what gives me the right to do that, except that I can. What gives me the right, you know, to eat an ear of corn, right? What gives me the right to um, take the intestines of a cat and make guitar strings? I mean, I, I, you know, chop down a tree and make, you know, well, it's a moral statement. Now, part of that is because the way we use the word nature is very different from the way they would have used the word nature. So let me pause for a moment and um, talk a little bit about nature. When I say nature, um, we're going to bring nature into the city. What comes to mind? Hmm? Trees. Trees. Okay. When the rats brought the bubonic plague into Siena, were they bringing nature into the city? Right? They were. Were they not? Is that not natural? Is the plague not natural? What gives us the right to eliminate the life of... Um, of a bacterium. Well, I always explain it to my granddaughter, who's four years old, this way. I do not go out in my backyard searching for ants and roaches or spiders, right? If they're out there, I'll leave them alone. But if they come in my house, they're dead, right? <laughs> and... Um, so I think that's sort of the answer of what gives us the right to kill a bacterium. Uh, but, the, um, but there's a more serious point to this, and that is that the, the word nature is a Latin word, natura, and there are several sort of things associated with it. If you look it up in the dictionary, you'll discover that the first definition is, if I used it in a sentence, it means the irreducible essence of something. Um, so if I said, what is the nature of the problem? That is how it would have been used. And the Greek term for this, uh, as using Aristotle as an example, would have been physis. Physis. There was physis and metaphysics. And physis was the physical physics, and the meta metaphysics was that which traveled alongside of it, or in front of it, or beside it, um, which, um, which was the thing thought, right? And thoughts were real in the same way that... Um, that the physical material world that has space and occupy, I see it, I touch it, I feel it, I hear it, I smell it through the senses, this aesthetic experience of this, right? As opposed to something like justice, which is a little more, uh, it's a real thing, but it is a little more ephemeral, a little more difficult to define, particularly materially. Um, so so um, the, the, the term nature actually meant at this point in time, what is the nature of the plant? What is, its, what is its essence? Whereas today, we would just say it's anything that's not artificial. I just despise this uh, sloppiness. And I'm going into this sort of lengthy sidebar because uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen architects say, you know, I want to bring nature in the city. And I will always say, well, my dog poops down in the park. Is that actually nature in the city? Well, the, the answer is yes, but it's not a very good nature because that's going to have E. coli bacteria and that's going to go into the storm base, storm drain that's going to sit down in there with all those oak leaves in the bottom of that thing because the city doesn't clean it out and it's going to get anaerobic and then when it rains it's going to flush all that anaerobic bacteria into Peachtree Creek, which means somebody down at West Point, Georgia is ultimately going to have to drink that stuff. All right? So, um, what we're looking at here is the process of pruning back grapevines. And this practice comes from that. It's an old horticultural practice. And the result is that in the spring, where the cut has been made, adventitious growth comes out at the point of the cut. Uh, that's actually what we're seeing here. And then that, because you can control it in a particular way, uh, these are chestnut trees, actually. You can do this with it, which means that you can use it architecturally 
Uh, in certain ways, this, for example, this kind of colonnade of trees, which then works perspectively toward whatever that is, assuming that's um, at the end of that LA, which is uh, fairly significant, I suppose. And um, this was certainly put into service over a long period of time, and uh, I think it's quite beautiful. And I will also mention for the architects in here, there's nobody in the United States that knows how to do this, almost no one. You might find somebody at uh, Winterthur Gardens or something, but uh, don't expect, uh, you know, the Atlanta Public par uh, Parks maintenance crew to know how to do this. And if you watch them do it in France, what you realize there's even special equipment that they use to do this with, and that there are whole families and generations of people who have been doing this. Now, what they cannot do in France very well is grow grass, whereas we can grow grass out the wazoo here. You have these guys in, you know, uniforms that come out. They look like Ghostbusters. You know, they have this stuff, backpacks on and masks and everything, and the trucks pull up, and they have all this sod rolled up. <laughs> About two days, you've got something that looks like Augusta National Golf Course uh, somewhere out here in suburban Atlanta. Ba-boom. Uh, the French couldn't do that if their lives depended on it, and we can't do this. So um, just keep that in mind materially <laughs> because it, you can never design something that someone can't doesn't know how to do. All right? uh, now, the significance is that what this means is that the carotene pigments, um, these are actually uh, tilia cordata, little leaf linden, and uh, when the new growth comes out, the new growth carries with it uh, carotene pigments before the leaves come out. The uh, uh, maple trees have a lot of this in it, for example, and that's why they turn, some of them turn red um, in the fall when the chlorophyll, when the tree stops producing chlorophyll, which acts as a mask over the top of the carotenes, um, it, it reflects light in the green spectrum, and then when it declines, it, it, it reflects light in the red spectrum. So for the French in the 17th century, this was working with nature because they were, in fact, um, sort of revealing the nature of the material. Architecturally, it becomes significant because it means that you can create, as we see here in the Tuileries today, or in, in the 80s, you can see that there's an interior room here. And then here we have that kind of sidewalk we were looking at at the plan with the main axis extension that becomes the Champs-Élysées uh, over here on the right through the trees. Uh, these old men, um, my age, out there playing uh, boule, bachi. Now, uh, if we go to the uh, Tuileries, not the Tuileries, to the Jardin de Luxembourg, built by the wife of Henry IV, um, eventually put into public service. It's a public park now. And um, the building, uh, the, uh, you're, you're looking here at Soufflot's Pantheon, that's saint jean Genevieve. And there's a statue of Pan because the building is known as the Pantheon. This is the model for the United States Capitol, by the way. And um, you see these chestnut trees that have been pruned back and pollarded in that way, and then if we walk outside the garden, what we see is that the buildings, the apartment buildings, are doing the same thing, reinforcing that same geometry. So the axis of the Pantheon here is extended down what is, in fact, the old uh, Roman decumanus and into the garden itself. And again, it changes at the edge of the park from the vegetal to the mineral component. See that? And that is what will allow uh, Paris. Here we see the Place de la Concorde. Just to orient you, here is the Louvre. There is Place Dauphine. Uh, really, all of this really begins here. Here is the Louvre, the extension. The Tuileries came across here. This is actually then the extension. That's Lenotte's overall scheme, which is extended across the Place de la Concorde with the obelisk, and then up the Champs-Élysées to the Arc de Triomphe. And there we have the round point, or the étoile, the star, with these avenues that are radiating out from it, including the Avenue Foch, which was originally uh, built in 1855 by um, Baron Georges Eugène Osman and Louis, uh, not, uh, Louis Napoleon, the Emperor Napoleon III. And there you actually see a perspectival view of that. Uh, this becomes significant, I think, in a number of ways because Talk about superficiality. This was the site of the guillotine during the revolution, right here. 
And um, there's no mention, no memorial of that, nothing, to the 2,000 people who lost their heads there. Um, we are out of time, and uh, so that's okay, because let me, let me tell you, before you start packing up, um, we are now exactly one lecture behind, which is okay, because I was supposed to go to Berkeley, California on November the 2nd, and I've decided not to go. So I'm going to revise the syllabus, and I will, we will pick up then planned cities in the Islamic world, which are coming at the same time, at exactly the same time period as this transformation that we see in France between 1550 and 1680. So uh, we want to not leave the cities in the Islamic world in this kind of medieval condition. I want to advance it forward and take a look then at planned cities and uh, the sort of comparison that we can make to these moves that are being made here in France. Okay? I will revise the syllabus, so if you have downloaded and printed the current syllabus that's in there, uh, you will need to do it again, but give me until Wednesday to make that adjustment, okay? Okay. If you haven't picked up your test, we have it here. <laughs>